So read standing, please, and in honor, in honor of God's Word, and we're going to read together John chapter 14. So take a Bible and go ahead and turn there. John chapter 14. John chapter 14. We're going to read verses 1 to 14. And as you're turning there, let me just set a little of the context for what we're going to be reading uh, today. So Jesus has just announced that he is going to be leaving and he is going to die. And so the disciples are confused, they're hurt, they're uh, wondering what is coming. And so I just want you to try and tap into a bit of that feeling. Some of us know the feeling of saying goodbye. Some of us have just said goodbye to our college age uh, children. Uh, others of us will be saying goodbye to our preschoolers on up through grade school and high school. Others of us have said goodbye to friends and family. You know that feeling, right? So with that in mind, listen as I read John chapter 14 beginning at verse 1. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and come back and take you to be with me that you may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus said, don't you know, Philip, don't, no, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father, and I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the, Fa the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. Hmm. So may God add his blessing to the hearing and reading of his word today. Go ahead and be seated. And as you're seated, go ahead and pull out the outline in your bulletin. Those of you online, again, great to have you with us this morning. And you'll find the outline with today's bulletin, Pastor Steve said, over at our website, hillcrestjamestown.com. This morning, I'm going to share the first of two what we're calling vision messages. We like to do this about uh, twice a year. Uh, two messages regarding our vision. I've titled this, this morning's message, Greater Things Are Coming, and Greater Things Are Coming. Next week, Pastor Steve will preach the second part of this series. Now, these 14 verses in John chapter 14, this passage, I have to tell you, is the passage I have been standing before and meditating on and praying over for the past eight months. I've repeatedly spoken of it to our pastors, to our staff, to 60 or so of you, our church family that serve in various forms of leadership, and at our annual celebration in June, we talked about it. I can't let go of this passage, and especially one verse, and I want you to look again at verse 12. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. That is a staggering statement because we know some of what Jesus did, don't, don't we? It's recorded here in this book. We know of his amazing teaching as he traveled up and down and all around the land of Israel, attracting and changing the lives of thousands of people who he would call to follow him and, and walk in his way. We know of Jesus' miracles. At least 37 of them are recorded in by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in their gospel accounts. Jesus healed blind people. He healed deaf people. He healed paralyzed people and sick people and diseased people. And we know that Jesus demonstrated power over nature. He calmed storms with a word. He transformed ordinary water into wine. 
Jesus miraculously provided food for hungry people, multiplying a few loaves and fish to feed thousands on multiple locations. And he also cast out numerous demons and raised at least two people from the dead. So, so the question our leaders and I have been asking the Lord is this, what are these greater things, Jesus? What are these greater things that you want to do at Hillcrest in and through you and me and us together in this season? And Jesus has been answering. <laughs> Today I'm going to share with what the Lord has been saying. I believe the Lord has opened what the Apostle Paul described as gr a great door of opportunity. These are exciting days in this church family. There are some amazing opportunities for greater things to be done in Jesus' name. But as the Apostle Paul said, he said, yes, great door, a great door of opportunity is open, but many oppose me. And many, many may oppose us. There may be miscommunication. There may be difficulty. There may be obstacles. There may be opposition. And that shouldn't surprise us. That shouldn't surprise us one bit because later on in chapter 16 of John's gospel, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have what? I have overcome the world. So let's begin with reviewing God's vision for Hillcrest. This is a, a, a divine direction the Lord gave us as a church family now about 20 years ago. As we prayed and sought the Lord together, he gave us a vision that can be summarized in one sentence. So I, I want us to read it together and we'll put it on the screen. So read it with me. Providing hope to the nations through authentic life change in Christ. That is what gets me up out of bed every morning. That is what fires me up to serve as a pastor at this church, providing hope to the nations through authentic life change in Christ. Can there be any doubt that our world increasingly and desperately needs a message of hope? Oh my, I mean, just Friday, I read of a young man, uh, lived in the town, grew up in the town where we live, newly married, who died unexpectedly, the obituary said. And of course, we, we've grown to know what that means, right? It's not a car crash. It's not cancer. It's a suicide. Over the past 20 years, rates of suicide, drug overdose, and mental illness uh, as a whole have dramatically increased. Roll back the clock five years ago, right? And young adults, children, were already under increasingly in, in incredible stresses. And then came the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was like someone poured gasoline on the campfire. Each of us, and, and the people in our community, and in our state, and the world we live in, desperately needs a message of hope. But unlike the promises of some perhaps well-meaning politicians, right, or the purveyors of the newest New Age psychobabble, right, the message we proclaim is a radical, life-orienting, reorienting message of transformation in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not a message just for time. This is a message for eternity. You see, real hope is found in Jesus Christ. Anything less than knowing him is just tinkering around with surface issues. We never get to the root. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Only in Jesus can, can our, have our past, our sin, our mistakes, and all the ways we've blown it, have it nailed to a cross and done with. In Jesus, we can gain a whole new resurrected way of living, a new, whole new power, a whole new peace, a whole new boldness and assurance for life and for eternity. And if that sounds too good for you, to you, if that sounds too good to be true, it's not. Because to know Jesus is to know God. To know Jesus is to know the, the God who made the universe, the stars, the galaxies, the planets, and, and made every person on the planet. To know Jesus is to know the God who made you and knew you before your days were even numbered, before you were even formed in your mother's womb. He knew you. To know God is to know a heavenly Father who loves you so much with such an irrational love that he would send his only son to die in your place to save you from your sin, to give you a hope, to give you a future. To know Jesus is to know a God who works wonders and in powerful, amazing ways. And not only does he display his power in making and ordering the universe, he displays his power in making and ordering and changing and transforming you and me. 
He takes those of us who are burdened and stressed and maxed out, and he lightens our load. He takes those of us who, who are living for only today and gives us an understanding that we can live for tomorrow. There's a bright hope there. He takes those of us right, who have been a chain to an addiction and he sets us free. Am I right? He does. And those of, who of us have been too afraid of the future to even think about it, he comes and he gives us a whole new reason for getting out of bed in the morning. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Of course you do. Anybody who has known the Lord Jesus is to know all of these things and more. That's what he's done for me. That's what he would do for you and all who would come to trust him by faith. So the vision God gave us was to take that hope to the nations. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. Translated in 2023 20, terms, we're to take that awesome message of hope of, of Jesus to people here, to people near, and to people far away. So they too can experience real, authentic life change in Christ. See, Jesus promised. He promised greater things. It wasn't enough that he would reach and teach and help and heal people that were already alive when he was walking physically on the earth. No. God's heart has always been for the nations, for every group of people everywhere. But in order for, for you and me to experience those greater things, it's going to require greater faith. Yesterday's faith, the leftover faith from then, is not going to carry us through. The ways we've done it and the, the ways we've worked in the past may not be the ways we're going to work in the future. Greater things will require greater faith. And greater faith will require greater prayer. See, prayer orients us to the plans and purposes of God. And when we get on God's agenda, Jesus said he would do whatever we asked in his name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. And in case we didn't get it, he repeated it again in verse 14, chapter 14. He says, you may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. So some of you are wondering, All right, Pastor Mark, you seem fired up. What, what, what does this practically mean? What, what are these greater things going to look like? This is our so what. And for the rest of the time this morning, I want to unpack some of what the Lord has been revealing. Now, we don't know, we don't have clarity on all these things, but we have clarity on at least five things. The ways the Holy Spirit is leading us into some incredibly greater things. These are things that a year ago weren't even on our radar. And it's only been as we've been praying and seeking and believing the Lord has greater things for us that he's begun to reveal them one after another. And by God's grace, we're going to step into them with greater faith and with greater prayer. So here's the first one. Some of you may not realize that we have a new and, and rapidly growing ministry in Pakistan. I asked the first service a, a, a group crowd this, so let me ask you, how many of you have been to Pakistan? That's what I thought. Me either. Okay, how many of you um, would say your knowledge uh, of Pakistan, a scale of one to ten, one being, uh, I think that's in Asia, Pakistan's in Asia, and ten being, I speak Urdu, their language, fluently. Uh, how many of you would say that your knowledge of Pakistan is more like a one? All right, good, good, good. You're honest, appreciate that. Right, me too. So let me remind you of your geography from high school, right? Pakistan borders India, Afghanistan, Iran, and China. And while the pop population of, of Pakistan is roughly two-thirds of what we have in the entire United States, that population is squeezed into the size of one state, the size of Texas. Now culturally, religiously, it's a Muslim nation. In fact, only 0 0.02, not two, but 0.02% of the population of Pakistan would call themselves in any way Christian. 0.02% of the population would claim to be Christian. But, get this, through our out online outreach of Fresh Prayer on Thursday evenings, right, last November, the Lord connected us all the way to Pakistan to a young 22-year-old amazing young woman named Naomi. She's online probably with us right now. And, and she had come to know Jesus through a roommate at a youth hostel years before. 
And then in early January this year, Naomi asked if I would begin meeting with her and about 10 others to teach God's Word and to pray with them since there was no, re no church in that region of their country. And so it's literally since the 1st of January, a, a group of about eight of us leaders have been meeting weekly with who they call themselves Hillcrest Pakistan. I didn't give them that name. Whether we've adopted them, they've, they've certainly adopted us. And it has grown beyond our wildest expectations. Yesterday, this picture is from yesterday. There were 133 people with us yesterday. 17 new families have been added to this gathering in the past two months alone. And the testimonies of miraculous, and I use that, that term very carefully, miraculous physical, emotional, relational, mental, and yes, spiritual healing have been the most amazing things I have ever witnessed. It has been astounding. Every week we hear of more and more people experiencing the life-transforming, healing power of God in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and just this past week, we provided another case of Bibles and another stack of chairs for the more, people, the more and more people that keep coming. Yes, I blurred Naomi's face for security reasons. And earlier today, Naomi undoubtedly led, as she has done all summer long when she started earlier this summer, a Sunday school for nearly 50 children because they are hungry for the Word of God. Our leaders and, our, and especially our missions team have been praying, many of you have been praying for a missionary connection, a Pakistani pastor, some kind of Christian worker in that region who could encourage them to could maybe come alongside with some training or resourcing this group. And yesterday, we had a breakthrough. Many of you don't even know this yet. I haven't had a chance to tell you. We had a breakthrough because a pastor about 45 miles from where Hillcrest, Pakistan meets, right, attended with us online. And after we finished that meeting, I had, and our group had another half hour meeting with this pastor. I met his wife and his beautiful two children. And, and hearing them sing, the children sang for us. It, it, was, it was just amazing. But hearing his passion for Jesus, his heart for his nation, and his heart for the nation, I'll tell you what, it was humbling. It was inspiring. Hillcrest family, the Lord is leading us into greater things in Pakistan. I don't know where it's all going to go. The Lord knows. And by God's grace, we're going to press into it. But there's a big problem. It's a major problem. You probably haven't heard about it. Pakistan is preparing for a national election, and if you think our, our elections are chaotic in this country, you have any idea what chaos looks like. Because candidates are fomenting tensions against, and, and factions within the country, and, and especially against religious minorities, ethnic minorities. Earlier last month, or in early August, this led to an accusation of blasphemy against a Christian man and his son in Pakistan, that they had taken a Quran and, and written terrible things on it and then signed their name. Now, who does that? Who would do that? Suspicious from the get-go. But what happened was mobs of radical Muslims looted and then burned down 26 churches and 86 homes of Christians around the country. Our brothers and sisters in Pakistan, including Naomi, and including the pastor I talked to yesterday, are not asking for our money. They're asking for our prayers. They say, would you pray for us? It is a desperate time in this country. Please pray for us, for their safety, yes, but pray for their faith, that it would not falter, and pray for the advance of the gospel, even amid persecution. So I'm inviting you to pray with me this week. And if you will commit to praying for Pakistan, I want you to have one of these that I keep on my wrist. It says, pray for Pakistan. We had these made up. And I want you to put this on your wrist, and it will remind you. And every time you look at it, it will remind you to pray for Pakistan this week. We have a basket of them here. You're invited to get one after the service and pray with me throughout this week. But Pakistan isn't the only area we're being led into greater things. <laughs> no, no. And, and just... Just the past few months, the Lord has opened up for us a, a, an opportunity to form a refugee ministry. Something, again, wasn't even on our radar, I mean, months ago. 
And, and these are refugees that are moving into our community. So in partnership with a Christian ministry known as Journey's End, and their local rep is Beth Litton, who attends our, our um, sister church, Lakewood Baptist, right? We're beginning a refugee ministry. And for years, the definition of refugees, just so we're all clear, our definition is, uh, for the U.S. government of a refugee for years has been someone who demonstrates that they were persecuted or, or fear persecution due to race or religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. Now, I know, I know that we have political leaders in our country that don't believe, and, and others in our country that don't believe we should be allowing any foreigner into our country. And they invoke memories of 9-11 that we will commemorate next week, the horrific events of 9-11, right? And they will say, those refugees, you ha don't you understand, those refugees could be terrorists. And I say, yeah, it could be, but highly unlikely. And, I, and what I want to say to them is, you know what? Um, God forbid, you know, that anybody would ever break into your home, right, and ransack the place and steal your stuff, right? But let's say that happened to you. Would that mean that from then on you'd say, nobody is ever coming to my home again because they might be a robber? Of course not. You would meet new friends. You would have family. They would come to your home. You would take reasonable steps. You would take every precaution to guard your home against someone invading it again and stealing your stuff. So I just wanted to say that I believe that there's an awful lot of irrational fear driving responses to helping refugees. But, brothers and sisters, there is a much bigger biblical issue that we got to get our heads around this morning. I'll remind you what the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, that we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives. So you and I are called to think first as citizens of heaven before we think of ourselves as citizens of the United States of America. We are Christians first, and we're U.S. citizens second. We need to think biblically before we start thinking as Democrats or Republicans or Independents or Conservatives or Liberals or Progressives. And I don't have, a time, have time this morning. We don't have time. Someone asked me before the service, it's going to be a long message. How, how, I've got things to do. This. I said, I, it won't be. I could preach for a while, but no, it's, it's going to be short. Said, Hang on. It'll be okay. You'll be all right. I don't have time this morning to take us to an in-depth study, but by my count this past week, I counted 92 times in the Bible where the Lord calls his people to care for the widow, for the orphan, and for the foreigner among you. Let me just hit a few of the highlights. You don't have to turn here. Just listen. Exodus chapter 22, verse 21. God speaking through Moses says to his people, do not mistreat the alien or oppress him, for you were aliens in Egypt. Exodus 22, 9. Do not oppress the foreigner. You yourselves know how to feel it feels to be foreigners because you were foreigners in Egypt like for 400 years. That's my ad. At Leviticus 19, verses 33 and 4. When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing you, among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as you love yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 18 and 19. The Lord defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner residing among you. Give them food and clothing. You are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. You getting the point? Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 3. This is what the Lord says, do just. Do what is just and right. Do no wrong or violence to the foreigner, the fatherless, or the widow. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless or the foreigner or the poor. Over in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, do not forget to show hospitality to the foreigner, to the stranger. For by doing so, some have shown hospitality to angels that didn't know it. And then that great passage at the end of Mar Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 25, when Jesus is talking about the end of the age, the final judgment, when all of us will stand to give an account for how we have treated the widow and the orphan and the foreigner among us. Jesus says, when you did it to the least of these... You did it to me. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. And when I was a stranger, you invited me in. Can I say, it would be very easy for us 
And actually, I'll, I'll change that. It would be very lazy. It would be la very lazy of us to confuse refugees with illegal aliens. They are not the same. Refugees are not illegal aliens. Refugees are coming legally to our country. Say that with me. Refugees are coming legally to our country. So say what we want about the failure of our government to secure a border. Say what we want about the millions of people pouring across that porous southern border. But this is not the same thing. And those who think and try to equate the two, they're simply wrong. It's wrong. So the Lord has moved us and, and opened an incredible opportunity to form a refugee ministry. And this month as a church, we will help welcome and then acclimate a family fleeing war-torn Syria for the United States. Did you know Syria has been at war since 2011? Civil war. What were you doing in 2011? I wasn't even the pastor here. 2011. I was an associate pastor working part-time business. We were raising our kids. I remember a little bit what I was doing. Through that. I, that seems like a long time ago. Think about that. 12 years living in a hellish environment known as Syria. And, and fighting and Christians have got, been caught in the, in the crossfire, according to Open Doors, a ministry to persecuted Christians, says in some areas of Syria, Islamic militants have targeted Christian leaders for kidnap or attack since they have greater public visibility. This is designed to intimidate the entire Christian community. Most church buildings in those areas have either been demolished or repurposed as Islamic centers. Public expressions of Christian faith are prohibited and church buildings can't be repaired or restored. Even in safer, government-controlled areas, evangelism and converting from Islam to Christianity is seen as a, as a threat to social stability and is therefore heavily suppressed. So a family, the family coming has fled everything they've known probably for generations, perhaps hundreds of years, you think they wanted to leave their country? No, they did not. But because of the hellish environment that they've had to endure, they fled the country. And then they have lived in a refugee camp, not for days, not for weeks, not for months, but for years. Do you know only 2% of the hundreds of thousands of refugees that meet the standard of refugees, and it's a high standard, only 2% of those refugees will ever be settled to some other country outside of that refugee camp. 2%. So they have worked hard to finally get to a place where they could come to the United States. And I'll remind you of our heritage as a church. Hillcrest was founded by Swedes who came from Sweden. And we, we had the American Baptist church in, in town and they gave us a place in their building to meet. And then they bought us land. This church was founded by immigrants. So if anybody ought to have a heart for immigrants, for refugees, it ought to be us. Now, this refugee team is already organized. Uh, Karen Soderberg is teaming up with uh, seven or eight others. Uh, but if the Lord is calling you to be involved this morning in, in this, this effort, contact the church office, see Karen. We'll get you connected, okay? All right, the next two partnerships... I want to talk to you about is, is focused on reaching the most unreached in our world. We have, a fan, we have fantastic partnerships already. I mean, you hear about them almost every week with ministries in our own community, Pastor Dan and Pastor John, Leave Impact. You hear about these all the time, right? And as well as missionaries around the world. But our missions team, can I say, uh, has been working overtime this summer building two more exciting partnerships. And, and these will be focused on what's known as the 1040 window. Some of you may not be familiar with that term. 1040 window is used by missiologists, those who study missions. Uh, it, it's the area 10 to 40 degrees latitude, uh, known as the most uh, resistant belt. This is where those people live. 5.32 billion people live there, 70% of whom are known as unreached, meaning that they have no opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Zach and Carrie Wolf 
our missionaries with pioneers. It's an awesome Christian ministry. And they, as a couple, are building teams, working to send teams to go and reach people who live in the 1040 window. The Wolves are from Warren, Pennsylvania. Carrie's dad is the pastor of our sister church, Calvary Baptist there. They're an amazing couple. They'll be here later this month to share more about their ministry. And then we also have a, a, an amazing, sharp, new uh, millennial couple that's going to reach Muslims in India. And because of security reasons, I can't tell you any more than that. I can't tell you their names. Um, but they're an awesome millennial age couple headed out later this year. And if you'd like to know more about them, there's a sign up at the information station. Leave your name, leave your, leave your uh, email, and they will reach out to you. This couple will be with us later in October so you can hear more about the greater things that the Lord is planning to do through our partnership with them and sending them out. All right, a couple more, a couple more. <laughs> the Lord has also revealed in the last few months that there is a need and there is an incredible opportunity for a new outreach to law enforcement and first responders in our community. Everybody remembers Everybody, if we were to take time and have you share stories, everybody remembers the brutal restrictions, the rules, the regulations surrounding COVID-19. We, we have vivid memories. Some of us have PTSD from it, right? They were brutal. But what you may not realize is they, it was especially hard for several groups of people, but not least among them would be our police, our firemen, and our first responders who were often left to deal with enforcing those rules, regulations, and on all the rest. And they are also the ones who are first on the scene to deal with the rise in suicides. Who do you think is the first person that's there? And the overdoses, and the domestic abuse, and the host of other issues that we've already talked about. Well, we have an opportunity in October to be part of what's known as Faith in Blue. We will partner with our county sheriff, Jim Quatrone. Many of you know Jim. And uh, along with many police uh, departments and other uh, churches in our area to do a meaningful outreach to these public servants and demonstrate the love of Christ to them. They are, they are desperate need of some loving respect. And we're going to love on them. More details will follow very soon on that. Lastly, I want you to know that the Lord is leading us into a new prayer focus this fall. And we're calling it 30 Days of Thanksgiving. And it begins next month. Not just one day of Thanksgiving, but 30 days. From the middle of October to, the, to Thanksgiving Day, all five of our pastors, and plus another dozen or more uh, leaders here at the church have written 30 daily devotionals. We're going to produce our own printed guide, and we will make those available as an audio version of our podcast. And, and we will be posting prayer walls in this, this room again so we can pray over the needs and opportunities before us individually and as families. And there will be other opportunities and ways we can engage with the Lord, not just in one day of Thanksgiving, but in 30 days of Thanksgiving. This is an incredibly exciting time for us as a church family. This is where we're going. Greater things are coming. Not because, not because I said it, but because Jesus said it. And that's his will. That's his best for us. I don't know about you, but I'm saying, bring it on. Bring it on, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Hmm. Our good God, we thank you for calling us into a, relation, a relationship with you through our Lord Jesus. Thank you for what we've remembered at the table this morning. The price of our salvation was no less than the death of your son. But we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you arose from the dead and you have now come to live in each of us who come to trust you by faith. And your desire is to, to move us into greater things. We believe that. We sense that. We see it. So, Lord, strengthen our faith. Give us greater faith to believe you for more. Orient and, and change our thinking so that we would be on your agenda. Lead us into deeper prayer. Thank you, God, for time in your word this morning, time together to talk and share and worship you. You are worthy. So may, 
May our obedience and our, our following of your leadership this fall, this fall grow your kingdom and bring you great glory. That's our aim. That's our prayer, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand as the...